Okay, hi there, welcome to a revision video where we're going to take a few minutes to look at some of the cognitive or behavioural biases that can affect people's decisions, their choices. And the existence of such biases calls into question uh, traditional orthodox models that assume that people always act rationally, trying to maximise their individual self-interest, maximise their utility. In your exams, it's a good example just to be aware of some of these biases, be able to recognise them, provide some examples, and then link them into your economic analysis. So first of all, quick recap, what is behavioural economics? Well, essentially it's research that adds elements of psychology to traditional economic models to hope, hopefully, to better understand decision makers by all kinds of economic agents, be they investors, consumers, and other economic participants. Behavioural economics is important when you are asked, asked to challenge the uh, underlying assumption of rational choice in markets. We have a separate video on rational choice. But what is it? Quick reminder. Well, rational choice involves the weighing up of costs and benefits and trying to maximise the surplus of benefits over costs. For most decisions, a rational agent will look at the marginal benefit and the marginal cost of a decision to decide whether or not to go ahead. However, we know that in the world, uh, the real world, that people inhabit, the complex, messy world, often there are good examples of cognitive or behavioural biases. And a cognitive bias is simply a systematic error in thinking that happens when people are processing and interpreting information in the real world around them. And that affects the decisions and the judgments they make. So let's work through what some examples of cognitive or behavioural biases. The first one is the default bias, otherwise known as the status quo bias. And this is where humans are often very resistant to change. They don't like change in their lives. They follow well-established daily routines. Those routines exhibit strong default behaviour. And these, these can be quite, uh, uh, quite hard to change. Status quo bias is when people stick with a previous decision even if it's perhaps no longer the most appropriate decision to make. And a good example would be things like our menu habits when we go out to places like Nando's. I, for one, nearly always have the same items on the menu, regardless of the situation. I have a very strong default bias. Loss aversion is another important bias to be aware of. Now, loss aversion happens uh, when we emphasise losses, more than potential gains. And losses, in fact, can be twice as painful as a similar gain. In an interesting experiment, it was found that professional golfers, on average, score lower on a hole when it's labelled as a par, when it's labelled uh, as a par four, versus when the hole is labelled as a par five. Uh, golfers tend to play better. They sink more putts on harder holes because they, they feel the pain of a bogey uh, more than the pain of perhaps a, a lost birdie or making par. Obviously, a, a, a bogey in a golf round means you lose a stroke to the field, and that can feel very painful <coughs> to highly paid professional golfers. Another bias is anchoring. Now, anchoring is the idea that uh, we give you a piece of essentially relevant information as a, as a prelude, as a prime before asking your question. So, for example, if I was to ask you how many countries are members of the United Nations, have a moment, think about it, and uh, write a number down on a pen, a pen and paper beside you. And then if I was to ask you, uh, prior to the pandemic, in the last two full seasons before the pandemic, how many goals did Messi score, both for club and country? Well, there's no obvious link, is there, between how many countries there are members of the United Nations and how many goals Messi scored, uh, but in fact, thinking of this number might, might anchor your choice for this one. The correct answer is 81. Hearing or thinking of a random number can influence estimates on completely unrelated topics. The so-called oh, anchoring effect. So anchoring uh, is the tendency to rely too heavily on the very first piece of information that you learn or you hear. It often happens when people make irrelevant information as a reference point. And uh, people may use an anchor point as an e of, an, of an event as a value that they know uh, to decide or to estimate. Some businesses use false anchors. I love this example. A sign above the counter. Donuts, 25 cents each or three for one dollar. 
hmm, wait a minute, uh, the customer thinks I can get four donuts for my dollar. So he decides to buy four donuts instead of three. The customer, well, why did you put the sign up? Shopkeeper, well, before I put that sign up, people you need, only need to buy one donut. The use of a false anchor can act as a, a trigger to get people to change their behaviour. Framing is important. Now, framing is the way that choices are described and presented to you, and they can often have an insane effect on the choices that you make. Framing a question or offering it in a different way often generates a new response because it changes the comparison set it's viewed in. If you think about, for example, the, the relative price of Nespresso capsules, the coffee capsules that go into Nespresso machines, I mean, they're relatively expensive, and for some people, it is an expensive way of drinking coffee, particularly if you compare and contrast it with the cost of a, of a cup of instant coffee, so, such as Nescafe Original, much cheaper per cup. And the framing bias is that if your frame of reference is a cup of instant coffee, then Nespresso capsules look, well, they look tremendously expensive. However, if you change the point of reference, if you compare Nespresso capsules to a, a coffee at Starbucks or Costa or Subway, I assume it's £2.20 in this example, well, then it looks as if Nespresso coffees are ridiculously cheap. In fact, some would argue they're almost practically giving the coffee away. So framing does make a big difference. Let's move on to overconfidence, another example of a cognitive bias. Overconfidence, sometimes called the hot hand fallacy, happens when we become overconfident in our own ability due to recent success. So a basketball player hits a bunch of three-point three shots and they think they've become the world's best basketball player. Or you pick some stocks and shares that do pretty well in the first few weeks and that increases your confidence in your ability as a stock picker. And this can lead to quite significant behavioural problems, particularly in financial markets. Confirmation bias is quite interesting. This is favouring information that conforms to your existing beliefs and discounting evidence, essentially ignoring evidence, that does not conform. So confirmation bias is really only paying attention to information that, that reinforces your beliefs about particular issues, climate change, minimum wage, Brexit, and so on. Often it involves living in an echo chamber, or you only follow people on social media who pretty much share your viewpoints. Or choosing news sources, newspapers, magazines and online that present stories that support your view. Confirmation bias. Social proof. Now social proof takes us into the area such that the individual decisions and choices that people make are often heavily influenced by the networks, the social communities in which people live. And social proof happens when an individual looks to the behaviour of their peers to inform their decision making. Uh, for example, they might, uh, who knows, if you're a heavy drinker, you might hang around with other heavy drinkers, typically with students, I guess. <laughs> herd behaviour is another form of social behaviour, herd behaviour. And this is where individuals act collectively as part of a group. Uh, and that can go against your natural instincts and can often be irrational. There are two generally accepted explanations of herd behaviour. First of all, the social pressure to conform. People want to be accepted, and this can mean behaving in the same way as others, even if that behaviour goes against uh, what might be right for you. And secondly, individuals often find it hard to believe that the large group could be wrong. You know, four heads are better than one, for example. And they, they follow the group's behaviour in a mistaken belief that the group knows something that the individual doesn't. And this is sometimes described as the bandwagon effect or groupthink. Basically, herd behaviour is particularly common in financial markets and also in goods and services markets. It's basically making a decision based in part on the behaviour and choices of others. And sometimes in economics, although choice is good, we can have too much of it. Choice overload happens when there are too many options to make a fully informed, rational decision. Don't overload the consumer. If you're offering them types of jam, people often revert to middle options when they're given choices. Uh, and uh, and there's just, sometimes there's just far too much choice. <laughs> Although you might want a million shades of different types of paint, it is time consuming and inconvenient to find precisely the right paint. Social norms, again, building into this idea that our behaviour is biased towards the communities and the cultures of the groups that we live in. 
So a social norm is a prevailing norm or custom of behaviour within well-defined social groups. And these norms have become accepted by the majority of a, of a given community. So uh, whatever it is, you know, queuing in shops, observing white lines in car parks, social norms have become accepted and much of our behaviour is influenced by other people's behaviour, particularly those we respect or hang around with. And social norms can change. Social norms, for example, about smoking in public places, about drink driving and so on. Those social norms can and often do change. Altruism is another important idea. The phenomenon for humans to behave with more kindness, more fairness than would be the case if they behaved rationally. Now, in many ways, altruism can be a self-interested phenomenon. People get a benefit, they get a satisfaction uh, from giving particularly in an age of social media, uh, where that giving can be made public. Altruism is also linked to the concept of inequity aversion. Humans do not like unequal outcomes. And uh, altruism and fairness uh, are fundamental issues, particularly in a world of growing income and wealth inequality. Can I recommend to you, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, a fantastic website called visualcapitalist.com. You just go to Google and type in visualcapitalist.com uh, and uh, type in 50 cognitive biases and you can download an absolutely terrific infographic of some of the most interesting biases affecting behavioural decisions and uh, how uh, some great examples to go with them so you can increase your knowledge and awareness on this key, key topic. There we go. This has been a quick-fire journey through some of the cognitive biases that affect people's behaviour. hope you found it useful. Take care, look after yourselves, and see you again sometime soon.